as I was wandering, I stumbled upon this old wall in the middle of nowhere in some old forest in Sweden. You can't help but wonder what it was for. I don't know anything about it. It might be a hundred years old, perhaps a thousand. Was it meant to keep cattle in or to keep people out? Whatever the purpose, in general, these old structures show us that the lands we are born on are not natural. They are man-made. They are also the product of the thoughts and the actions of the men and women who dwelled here, the ancestors who came before us, the people who shaped their environment and left it behind for us. These used to be our people's habitats. And whether or not our forefathers had us in mind when they were building these things, we did inherit their work. Even though this simple structure is nowhere near as impressive as the pyramids of Egypt, I do believe that we have the right to say these are our ancestral lands, once inhabited by our people. We should dismiss this modern notion that history has no relevance to us, that we ought not to take any pride in the lives of our ancestors, nor of their achievements. But we have every right to do so. As I was just wondering what these walls were for, their purpose became instantly clear when I looked over to the field. You can see that this farmer's field was once littered with these very rocks. Sometime long ago, people have had to clear these fields in order to create agricultural land. You see, in Northern Europe, having always been a woodland, the transition from hunter-gatherer societies to a bit more advanced civilization of agriculture and pastoralism meant we had to create our own land first. And here's an example of what that area would have looked like before people began transforming wild nature into farmland. They had to cut down the trees, remove their roots, and then still labor more to remove heavy boulders and rocks, all in order to create a field suitable for agriculture or pastoralism. Look, it's littered with boulders. Try turning this into a pasture using nothing but the tools of the 16th or 17th century, or perhaps even of the 9th century. And over here you see a giant boulder they obviously couldn't move. But it shows how much effort the ancestors who once inhabited these lands had to put into creating a life for their families and their communities. Every inch of this field is stained with our people's blood, sweat and tears. Life here had to be won from nature's cold soil. Nothing, literally nothing was given to our peoples for free. I believe most of Europe is like this. Europe was built up to what it is today over a period of many thousands of years. Long, dark periods of great effort and great sacrifice were acquired to bring us into the modern age. People broke their backs here just to feed their children. This is something worth defending. This is something worth fighting for. We should never abandon Europe, no matter what happens. We should proudly say to ourselves and to the world, this, this is our land. Hello everybody, this is uh, Johannes Teranis speaking from Sweden once again. Uh, since this is my 100th video, since I started making videos, I suppose it's time to tell you a little bit about my personal story. Originally, I started making videos because I wanted to practice speaking. I wanted to become a public speaker, even in a foreign language, since English is my second language and Dutch is my mother tongue. And I believe I've come a long way to achieving this goal, but my goals haven't been achieved yet. Besides this personal goal of learning to speak well, I also intended to push the sort of information out that is necessary for the survival of our people. So growing up in the Netherlands, I went to a Catholic primary school and our history there started with the story of a Saint Willibrard who came to the Netherlands around the 7th century to Christianize the European peoples, to Christianize the Dutch peoples. Statues of Wotan, the old Germanic god, for example, 
were smashed and sometimes replaced by statues of some Christian bishop or another saint. I, growing up, I didn't know anything about my ancient ancestors and I took a great interest in them. I wanted to know all about the Germanic peoples, who they were, how they lived and especially where they were from. You see, when I was traveling around Europe um, a few years back, six or seven years ago, I did a tour around Eastern Europe. I came to this hostel where someone asked me, where do the Germanic peoples come from? And I couldn't offer the answer, but I can now. You see, the Southern peoples, the Roman, the Greek, and the Hebrew peoples, they had a written history and we don't. The Southern peoples also have stone architecture and the people of the North largely don't or didn't. The Germanic peoples who settled in these woodlands in several waves are uh, five to 7,000 years ago and who mixed with the pre-existing Mesolithic and Neolithic populations that were also living here, they built their dwellings, their settlements with wood. And so most of whatever they ever built went up in flames eventually or rotted away. And there's simply no trace of it other than some floor plans that you may find, for example, uh, in Viking Age settlements. Uh, for the fun of it, I took a DNA test, both on 23andMe and Ancestry.org, though I gave them a false name. I called myself something like uh, Mustafa Mohammed. <laughs> and then it tells you that uh, Mohammed is the most popular name in London nowadays. Either way, uh, my DNA test showed me that through my father's paternal lineage, that is the father's 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 and so on, I am indeed a descendant of those Yamnaya people who came to Europe on horseback, carrying their carts with them, basically the Aryan supremacy, the milk drinking and meat eating, a strong man who conquered Europe. And the modern theory goes that if you read a lot of the books, it says that one of the reasons why these Yamnaya people were able to conquer Europe isn't just that they had the innovation of horses and carriages, they had invented the wheel after all, it's that they also probably likely brought the Black Plague with them. You see, some of these men of the Yomnaya peoples, the Aryans, so to speak, they had become immune to this pathogen, to the Black Plague. And you can only imagine what it would be like for someone to walk into Northern European settlements of the Mesolithic and the Neolithic peoples, hunter-gatherers and agriculturalists, and within a few days, they start to die off like flies. It would give you a sense of of total supremacy over these peoples. You can just walk into their communities and without even having to fight them, you kill them off. But they did fight them. The Yamnaya peoples, for example, when we see confrontations, we see that their victims have uh, blunt crashes in their skulls. Turns out that riding on a horse, they would use a sort of hammer to smash people's skulls in, to smash Neolithic skulls in basically, and get rid of them that way as well. On top of that, their diet of milk and meat gave them superior body strength, especially the males, but also the females who were a bit fatter and more fertile. And in the end, the males of these Yamnaya took over the females of the Mesolithics and the Neolithics and so founded the modern European peoples. But the story of conquest, of course, isn't all there is to it. Through my mother's maternal lineage, the mother's mother's mothers and so on, it turns out that I am also a descendant of a woman who was living in Northwestern Europe almost 28,000 years ago. That practically makes me part of the fauna of Northwestern Europe. I am an indigenous species of the European continent. So I will accept no one, no one to tell me that we're all immigrants. You might say that in North America, if you're a white person living in the United States, you can say, well, we're all immigrants. But this doesn't hold true for someone like me. I belong here. This is my land. I literally evolved here for the past 28,000 years. Well, not me personally, but the people who came before me, obviously. Much of the story I've just told you applies to most people living in Europe, especially in Northwestern Europe. We are descendants of people who have been here for many, many thousands of years, going back almost to the age of the Neanderthals. The Germanic-speaking peoples got their language from these Yamnaya invaders. And first they settled in southern Scandinavia and northern Germany, and then slowly, up to three to two thousand years ago, they moved a bit down toward the Celtic lands uh, along the Rhine, the river Rhine and the Danube. My understanding is that the Celtic peoples 
uh, ranging from Ireland even all the way to Turkey in the old days, are also descendants to a large degree of these Yamnaya type people, at least the Celtic language is part of the larger uh, family. It wasn't until our contact with the Roman Empire, which started about 2400 years ago, when you hear of the first Germanic tribes trying to fight the Roman Empire, and they did so, they fought the Romans primarily asking the Roman Empire to please can we have some land for our cattle so we can raise families there. And here you also recognize some of the naivete of these Germanic peoples in their dealings with the Roman Empire. Very often they would wait for a kind response from the Romans, but the Romans never had any interest in allowing the so-called barbarians to live among them. But the Romans too, Romans too, also are to a large degree descendants of the initial, the original uh, Yumnaya tribes and the Scythians and the Goths and so on and so forth. Before Christianity, there used to be this religion that bound all of us, or at least our ancestors. So they say that the ancient god of the Yamnaya was called Jeus Peter, Jeus Peter. I wouldn't know how to pronounce it correctly, but I do know that this god became the Deus that we speak of in French language today, or Dieu, which means God. It also means Zeus, Zeus, and it means uh, Jeus Peter, Jupiter, Jupiter of the Romans, and also a god named Tyr among the Norsemen. The northern peoples, even today, Scandinavian languages, they have a tendency of shortening words to the very bare minimum. So the word tear might very well come from Jeus Tyr. But I've spent quite some time thinking about then where exactly did the god Odin come from? This old god of the Germanic peoples, but wasn't originally part of the Yamnaya pantheon somehow? And there are two schools of thought here. One that says that uh, all human culture can be traced back to a universal original culture that started in East Africa. And that means that whether it's Odin or Tyr or Zeus or Apollo or Jupiter, whoever, they all come down to the same general story. Uh, there's a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces that also promotes this idea of a, of a single universal hero that happens to have uh, cultural differences around the world. But I don't subscribe to this school. There's another school of thought that goes like this. The god Odin is so different from every other culture around the world that it must have come from Europe itself. This is a native god that was thought up or born here. And there's a book titled Odin, God of Death, which explores this concept of Odin being separate, meaning not a universal not meaning not traceable to a universal origin, but having been born of Europe itself. And the theory goes that because here in Europe, we were always confronted with the darkness, the winter times, when uh, every year the winter season comes and all the plants and the trees die, the leaves fall off, you know, the grass dies. And as a consequence, your cattle won't be able to find much to eat unless you prepare some hay for them to eat during the winter time. Now, if your cattle also dies off in the wintertime, especially the older ones, because it's cheaper to feed the smaller animals, you would slaughter the older ones before winter. If you don't prepare for the winter, then your children start to die and your elderly also start to die. Uh, it has always been, for as long as people were living north of the Rhine and the Danube in Northern Europe in the colder territories, the people living here have always traditionally been confronted with annual death. So much unlike the peoples living, say, in African lands in Central Africa, where the leaves never fall from the trees. There is no such thing as leaf disappearing trees in Africa. That happens here. We are confronted with death, and wouldn't it make sense that the people who evolved here, who grew up here, would have looked at death as the highest authority of life? In fact, the god Odin whether as a god of death or in another form, lives on in our present modern time in several different forms. Legend has it that the Dutch Saint Nicholas, for example, is really a Christianized version of the old Odin. When the Catholics came here to the north to try to Christianize our ancient peoples, they couldn't succeed in getting rid of people's belief in this Odin fellow. And there's probably a good reason for it, that because even though Christianity arrived to Northern Europe, death in the form of winter kept returning. The concept of death never went away. Saint Nicholas, of course, 
was copied to North America with the Dutch settlers and turned Sinterklaas, St. Nicholas, into Santa Claus. But Odin also lives on in the form of death itself. If you look at European literature and European films where the character of death, a personified version of death comes along, how is death represented? Death is often represented as an older person, a male, wearing a cloak that hides some of his face and wearing a sort of sheath by his side. Odin, of course, is equally represented in the, in the Old Norse sagas as an older man wearing a dark grey cloak and wearing a spear. And in Christianity, in Christian literature later, Odin became basically the prototype for the devil. It wasn't until the arrival of Christianity, for example, that the location of Valhalla, yeah, the, the holy site of the, of the Asgardian gods, Valhalla was placed from a place on earth to a place up in heaven. This is a modern vi invention of the Viking Age. It wasn't until the Viking Age who the Vikings came into contact with Christianity and a lot of things began to be rewritten. For example, the original word for Valhalla, Valhol, fall hole, literally means a hole you fall into or a hole for the fallen. The fallen who fought on the battlefields when they were buried in a fall hole on earth. Uh, in the old Eddic literature, for example, Valhalla is often described as a place you can travel to on horseback. So it's a place on earth. It's a mass grave. Valhalla used to be a mass grave for the heroes. There is simply so much to say about our ancient ancestors that is probably best left to the study of books. But anybody who studies the literature that is still left over, you know, sparse Germanic literature, you will read about the peoples in the Icelandic sagas, for example, or in the Siegfried saga. You will read about people's thinking and people's behavior, and you will feel right at home. You will notice that these people thought and behaved the way we still think and behave, who became the catalyst of what is now called modern civilization. It was their descendants, basically, who either took to the seas or who traveled over land to capture the world and to discover all the other races and tribes and religions around the world. It was us in the end, those peoples who emerged from the forests, who had the mindset to be open towards interacting and trading with all the other peoples around the world and fight them if necessary. It is simply a very bad form of negative propaganda to claim that our Germanic ancestors or our Celtic ancestors or our Slavic and Roman and Greek ancestors as though there was something wrong with us, as though we, we, as though we were the barbarians, when we were in fact the ones who opened up the world to modernity. There isn't a patch on earth in Europe that hasn't been stained by the blood, sweat and tears of our immediate ancestors and there is no reason whatsoever why we should now surrender and give up what, what basically is ours. We have a right to study our history, our real history, and to disentangle ourselves from the, the great fictions and fabulations of, of people who don't care about us at all, who would rather see us disappear. We are here to stay, like an old oak tree whose roots still run deep and whose leaves still grow back every spring. Even if people think that they've defeated us or beaten us back, like the receding of winter, we shall return in full force from the spring. And this is what I believe. I believe the springtime of our people has only just begun.